Snowmen and snow women are all around us. We glimpse them from time to time, on park benches, in dimly lit back streets, unkempt, unclean, unwanted, men and women who have closed the door on life. Where do they come from? Where are they going? Who are they? We could never sink so low. Or could we? Today's story, The Snowman, is from the UK. It was written by Alastair Clouston, who was formerly a volunteer with our station for RPH. I'm Kim Dodsworth. The program, Queensland Storyteller. The night air is still and very cold. The snow lies on the ground in a thick, smooth, white blanket. The road is deserted with no traces of car trails or footprints. The city is silent. The long, dark street of two-storey houses stretches into the murky distance, each with the same dull, grey, pebble-dash walls. The branches of trees in the gardens are weighed down heavily with white powder from the flakes falling slowly and silently out of the dark sky. At the edges of the road, sodium street lamps cast perfectly rounded pools of ghostly bright yellow light onto the brilliant white ground. The snowfall becomes heavier, and gradually out of the darkness appears the dim outline of a lone human shape. A middle-aged man is trudging through the drift. He looks vacantly ahead. His movements are stiff and slow as he struggles to keep his balance. He wears a long, heavy grey coat. It's seen better days and is stained and dirty from many years of use. His trousers are likewise old, worn, dirty and baggy. His scuffed boots are down at heel with so many holes that he can feel the wet coming through them. His hair and long beard are matted, greying and unwashed, looking like a character out of a biblical story. The face behind the beard is thin and drawn, and his eyes are dark sockets with deep shadows below them. The falling snow settles on his head in a white cap of slush. He can't really remember when he ate properly or when he slept in a real bed. How long has it been? Months? Years? He doesn't remember. Temporal meaning simply disappears into that dark vortex of poverty and hunger. As he walks down the street, he looks through the windows of the houses on either side of the street. People are gathered in their front rooms, watching television, eating a meal, sitting by the fire. The man shivers and trudges on into the blizzard, shoulders hunched. He doesn't know where he's headed on this night. For him, life is reduced to the basics of survival, finding food, just any food, a piece of string to hold up his trousers, or plastic bags to wrap around his feet inside his boots to stop the rain getting in. Mostly he sleeps rough, under bridges or doorways, or if he's lucky, he has a cardboard box for shelter. He's tried homeless hostels, but you can never predict if they'll have any spaces on any given night. And particularly in the winter, the bed spaces fill up fast. Even then, every morning they are all pushed out onto the street again. So he tends to stay clear of hostels. Trudging from place to place, he's lucky enough if he can find a seat on the reading room of the public library. But this doesn't usually last. Library staff or police come in and ask him to move along. Life had not always been so for this man. As Philip Tomlinson walks, he thinks back to his days at university. A business honours graduate and then an MBA. He'd been young then, the world at his feet, an abundance of youthful confidence. His star rose, with promotions swiftly up through a leading finance company's ranks, then postings to Singapore and Hong Kong. It was a lavish lifestyle, with parties at the weekend, barbecues on the beach, high-profile clients. In Singapore he'd met Catherine, a young woman from his hometown. They'd seemed a perfect match, and had married a year later. By the age of thirty, he had risen to a senior position in the overseas department. There seemed to be no limit to the days of endless warmth, sunshine and brilliant blue skies. He and Catherine had eventually returned home, bought a townhouse in an upmarket part of the city. Smart friends, the nice house, the expensive company car, and tailored clothes. Philip had then gone into business with a number of colleagues from his work and became a senior partner. 
All this he'd achieved by the age of 36. He was successful, had a comfortable life, and was a devoted husband. It seemed to be a secure and happy life. But then something turned sour. Philip's relationship with Catherine began to go wrong. She'd gradually become detached, cold. And as the months went on, arguments flared up out of nowhere. He noticed, too, that she'd begun to show a lot more care in applying makeup and expensive perfume when she went out. There were messages left late on the answer phone to say that she'd be late back and not to wait up. He remembered accompanying Catherine to a business reception for a new product launch. She spent most of her time talking to a male colleague of hers. He sensed there was a little too much familiarity between them. The man was one of the younger, up-and-coming managers in her firm. Catherine had sidled up to Philip with a forced smile. Darling, this is James. He's just got that job managing our new account in Abu Dhabi. James looks at Philip and doesn't smile. Later at that same reception, a friend had walked past and told him, Watch your wife, old man. He'd not known what to make of this. It began to haunt him. He'd thought back to the times when Catherine had been away on business trips. Always when she came back, she'd seemed distant. There were frequent excuses not to be around him. The end came suddenly, after months of stomach-churning anxiety. Catherine had arrived back one afternoon from a week-long trip to Abu Dhabi. She'd sat down in the living room as Philip was working at his computer. They'd sat in silence for a while, and then, with no display of emotion, she'd said, I'm leaving. I'm sorry? What do you mean? I don't want to stay here any longer. I'm leaving you. She'd refused to talk about it, despite Philip's open panic and pleading. And with that, she'd walked out of the door, taking the suitcase she'd arrived back with. He remembered that moment. He had sat stunned and in shock. It felt unreal, as if this was not happening. There was just disbelief. He remembered how quiet it had been in the flat. He'd lain alone in bed that night, with the vacant space beside him, cramming the feelings of panic and desolation down. He'd willed himself not to feel anything. He'd gone to work the next day as if nothing had happened. He went through this for months, not told a soul. And then one day, the divorce papers had been handed to him in the office, and he'd realised that this was the final truth, that Catherine wouldn't be coming home again. Philip's world crumbled. He began to have panic attacks at work. His drinking increased at home, where there was just the aloneness to face. Then one day... He'd walked out the front door of the flat and simply posted the house keys through the letterbox. He'd just walked away and kept walking for the next seven years, disappeared and not looked back. And now, as he walks through the snow, he comes to the end of the long road. The houses give way to the shops and offices of a new town. Philip's feet ache from walking and from the intense cold. His stomach growls for lack of food. Despite the drifting snow, people are walking along the roads. There are snatches of muffled conversations and laughter. They walk hurriedly past him, heading towards wine bars and restaurants to drink, eat and discuss business. Philip pauses outside one restaurant, which is fronted with large glass windows. He peers into the interior. It's busy inside. The tables and bar space are occupied by groups of smartly dressed men and women in business attire. Then something makes him look again. He recognises one of his business partners, Tom Craig. Tom is talking to a woman in a business suit. Suddenly he stops and looks towards the figure outside. There's a sudden glint of recognition in Tom's eyes. He says something to the woman, then puts down his glass of wine and walks towards the door. He steps outside into the cold. Steam comes from his breath. He stares blankly at the ragged man before him. Phil, is that you? Philip stands and just looks into nowhere. He's thinking about what to say. Tom, it's been a long time. Where the hell have you been? We had police looking for you, television news, missing persons, newspapers, all that. It just disappeared. Nobody knew where you were. What happened? Philip stands. He doesn't know what to answer. I, I don't know. I've been here, there, everywhere. Philip forces a smile as he sweeps with his hand proprietorially over the landscape behind him. It's not funny, Phil. You know that Catherine was worried what had happened to you. 
Philip laughs ironically. That is funny. But there's no anger in his voice, just resignation. Why would she worry? She was the one that left. Philip is about to say something else when suddenly the glass door of the bar opens and a woman is talking. Tom, what are you doing out here? We're ready to go for dinner. She looks at the men disdainfully. Tom turns towards her. He answers impatiently. I'll be there in a second. He stands and looks at Philip and shakes his head. There's a regretful tone in his voice. I don't know what to say, Phil. He seems annoyed rather than pleased to see his old work partner, as if it's inconvenient. Tom seems ill at ease. He looks back at the door. Look, Philip, I really do have to go. I've got a client here for dinner. Philip answers, Yes, I know. Business calls. None of the men in the bar look toward the two figures talking outside. Some of the women cast nervous, furtive glances. Tom walks back inside. There's an aroma of cooking food, warm air and conviviality. Tom doesn't look back. The woman is talking to him as they walk back to the table. She looks briefly back at the lone figure standing outside. Philip pulls up the collar of his coat. He turns towards the road and begins to walk. He doesn't know where he'll go, but he just keeps walking, walking, walking. He disappears into the falling snow and the darkness of the cold night.